Following the British surrender, more than 100,000 military personnel and European civilians were rounded up by the Japanese and marched to camps around the island. Up to 65,000 of these men were Indian Army prisoners of war who had refused to join the Indian National Army, which the Japanese supported. They were kept in a separate camp from the Europeans and Australians. The former ruling class were deprived of their usual luxuries and forced to live a life of hardship. Sionan was bombed heavily during the fighting and the Japanese saw the prisoners of war as a viable workforce to get the island back into order. Apart from repairs, the new rulers also wanted to build a shrine at the Macritchie Reservoir, for which they mobilized 10,000 POWs for the job. My name's John Cooper. Uh, officially, I'm a battlefield archaeologist. I've been in Singapore now for three years working on the Adam Park project. And we've been studying the Adam Park housing estate, a series of 19 black and white houses, which became a focal point of fighting during the 1942 campaign. Um, but beyond that, 1942 to 1943, housed about 3,000 prisoners of war. There's a, a gentleman called Lloyd Ellerman, and Lloyd Ellerman wrote a diary. He was in Adam Park. He lived at 6 Adam Park. He was with the 8, signal, uh, eight Division Signals unit, and he diligently wrote and in pencil, scribed away uh, day by day what had been happening at Adam Park, the mundanity of life. And one of the things he does for, for us is he details almost day by day his food that he was eating uh, and going up to, to the, the kitchen at the back there to go and get. 31st May, 1942. Rice for first two meals with both flavored. Tea was good, oh. Rice with veg gravy, also piece of tart and real meat pasty. Rested after tea and bed at 10. The expression that the prisoners had and used on a quite regular basis was it's turned out rice again. I mean, the staple diet was rice. Um, each man initially was given about 22 ounces of rice a day. 22 ounces is it's a fair portion. It's like a cereal bowl full of rice. That's quite a lot. And when you look at it uh, uncooked, it was quite a, a big portion. What they lacked was something to put into it. Each person had a mug, which they generally kept on a string round the neck. And that was, that was the ration, it was... And we'd come in a line, hold out our mug, and get a dollop of food put in it. But it was a mixture of vegetables of all sorts. And um, it, it was uh, supposed to have a little protein in it. We were very unaware of what sort of meat there was, if there ever was any meat in it. And uh, just as well, because they say that cockroaches and rats and all kinds of things were in that food, because it was so impossible to get protein. And if we didn't know what we were eating, it, it was just as well. There's a guy called um, Aspinall, and Aspinall was a, a, a private in the um, Australian AIF, and he ended up at the Mount Pleasant camp in the black and whites at Mount Pleasant. And he's taken, he had a camera, a hidden camera, and he was taking wonderful pictures. And he has two shots of them actually making, preparing rice at Mount Pleasant. And they did it in these old oil drums. They washed out the oil drums, they filled them up with um, water, boiled them, put them on a standing fire, and they started boiling up the water and they chucked all the rations in. So you can imagine, like, the guys, you know, here's my bowl of rice, boof, in it goes. And um, initially, it came out as a real horrible, glutinous mess. Stuff that came out was almost unedible. You can imagine these British troops and Australian troops arriving at Adam Park, and they think, oh, well, we're going to have to do something, going to have to entertain ourselves and supplement our diet. So they started preparing these gardens up, and things like uh, they threw in the old, the, the good British stuff that they thought might be quite nice to grow, like tomatoes. 
And of course, they, a few months in, they realised that the tomatoes weren't, weren't going to grow at all. They were, they were disease-ridden and they didn't get enough um, right um, nutrients coming out of the ground for it. Uh, and then they started, well, let's have a look what the locals grow and see if we can have better success with that. And so they were, they were, um, they were looking at tapioca, they were growing raggy, they were growing uh, cucumbers. Uh, lo local local foods and, pro and products which they know they could they could grow in this particular climate, and of course their their connections with the locals, the, the Chinese and the Tamils coming into the camp saying, "Oh, you shouldn't be growing that; you should be growing this, and this is how you prepare it and stuff." The supply of food was helped by the setting up of a canteen on the camp, and the canteen was run by local Chinese. And the Japanese invited them in to set up a, a canteen. And they sold whatever they could legitimately to the prisoners. Well, the prisoners got their cash by the fact they were paid to work on the Shinto shrine by the Japanese. 9th September, 1942. My birthday, aged 24. Lunch was gorgeous. I had three fried eggs on rice bread fried and was good. By the way, the eggs were the third, fourth, and fifth I've had in almost 12 months. For tea, there was meat and had stew pasty and two boiled eggs. So sometimes the, the, the canteen ran out. In that case, you had to go and get this by other means. And that's where black marketing came in and trading, illicit trading beyond the wire at night um, came, came a, a, an element of the POW's existence. 15th July, 1942. I invested in some dates and a little sugar. The local women are doing a good trade over the wire. It's pretty disruptive to suddenly have about two to 3,000 soldiers coming into your neighborhood and needing to be fed. And they were taking resources from the local land. They, they, they were, they were um, making use of the, of the, local, the local area to get food. For example, they, 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 the soldiers sometimes would steal from local gardens. If they see vegetables lying around, they would take it. Notoriously and, and notably, they would, they would take food off the, um, the Japanese war graves. The, the, where, where the Japanese soldiers had laid out food for, for, their, for the fallen comrade. By the morning, the food would be gone, and the ghosts would be very hungry, as the Australians would say. It was the Australians were going around picking the food off the graves and taking it in. 5th July, 1942. Loaded 10 trucks during the day, and the dust nearly choked us. We handled about a 1,000 bags. I personally accounted for 80 or 90, I reckon. Saw quite a bit of the city in the truck, and the Chinese nearby were good to us. I received a cigarette and a couple of slices of pineapple. Why do we get this relationship building between POWs and, and the locals? What's in it for both parties? Um, this idea of trading, this idea of communicating knowledge about food and how best to prepare it, and what was the motivation behind it? We could, say, we could believe that it was all done on the best of intentions, that, that, um, just for humanitarian reasons. But there, was, there was certainly a degree of uh, trade, a certain degree of money, and, and, and beneficial that um, for both parties that they, they could have this mutual arrangement. Chinese workers at cold storage found ways to sneak supplies to the POWs. They served food right to the end of, on, on 17 February, and then it was taken over by the Japanese who, who made it into a, 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 a storage center for food, more for the military of the, of the Japanese Imperial Army. And uh, you find that uh, the, the employees of, of cold storage, many of them uh, were Asian Chinese. They were recalled back to serve in cold storage. Uh, some of them also tried to, uh, to help out the interns in the, in the jail by uh, giving uh, food, uh, you find that the prisoners of war also obtained food from the cold storage at that time. Uh, butter in particular was so popular and I remember one particular sauce, there was so much of it that some of the butter, the prisoners of war used it as a moisturizer for their skin. And uh, interestingly, after the war, lots of it was left behind. So apparently, either it was too much for the Japanese to consume or you find that, uh, you know, uh, they were not able to discover some of these stocks of food. You see. Food in itself 
became a fantasy. It became a, a stimulus for the prisoner. It, was, it became their, almost their, their, um, their goal, their aim, is, is to get food during the day. And they would fantasize. Food would be in all the conversations. Lloyd Ellerman's diary is a classic. He, he rarely did he miss writing down what he had to eat. 5th September, 1942. I made a cake. Just ground coconut, rice and rice flour. Not quite up to scrambled eggs, salmon rissoles or roast lamb. We've got a fantastic relic from Adam Park. Um, we found a, a, a menu, but this was written here. This is a menu of, a, it says, a normal dinner officers, at the officers' mess, Adam Park POW camp. And it lists what, what um, was on the menu. Potato crisps, vegetable soup, roast beef, Yorkshire pudding, baked marrow, roast potatoes, French beans, green peas, steamed cucumber. Then we've got rice cakes. You couldn't get uh, through a menu without having rice on the menu. Gula Malacca sauce and iced coffee, Swiss roll savouries, herrings on toast, uh, ended with frozen, frozen watermelon, iced pineapple fingers. Now that, that was supposedly a menu which was served up in the Adam Park officers' mess. I would like to think that um, it didn't happen that way. This is somebody's fantasy, what they thought was actually happening up at the mess. Today I'm making a dish called lobster a la bystander. This recipe is from a cookbook called Good Food, which was written by a prisoner of war called PCB Newington. And it really shows the extent to which POWs fantasized about food that they couldn't get. Of course, it's highly unlikely that this dish was ever actually made and eaten by the POWs during wartime. Here I've got some young coconut, which I'm going to grate into long shreds. What's also interesting about the POW recipes is that many of them incorporated ingredients that were probably found in and around the camp. Chilies, sweet potatoes, and in this case, coconut. The other ingredient in this dish is lobster. And of course, Canned lobster was already a luxury by the 1940s, but uh, something that the POWs definitely couldn't get. These days, it's much easier, of course, to get frozen or vacuum-packed lobster. So we're just going to cut this into chunks. Then we're going to take the lobster and mix it with the coconut meat and some tomato sauce. This is just pureed cooked tomatoes. And then we're going to season it with ingredients very familiar, even nostalgic to British POWs. A little bit of pepper, a little bit of sherry, a little bit of salt, and a little bit of paprika. PCB Newington, who was interned at the Syme Road camp, formed a gourmet club called Good Food there. And of course, that later became the title of his cookbook. Once a week, the members of the Good Food Club would meet outside Newington's hut, where, as Newington says, they dine sumptuously in their imagination. I'm going to spoon this into a casserole. Spread it out. And finally, dot the top with little pieces of butter. That should be enough. And now we're going to bake it in a moderate oven at about 180 degrees Celsius for about 20 to 30 minutes until it's sizzling hot, rich, and fragrant. The name of this dish is quite probably an ironic joke on the part of the POWs, whom of course could only stand by and dream of more luxurious food as they ate the meager rations that were given to them. A final garnish of fresh coriander leaves. And there we are, lobster a la bystander. In some camps, POWs would gather to talk about food or write recipes of dishes they wanted to eat. They dreamt of roasts, pies, cakes, and puddings. But they also wrote out recipes of simple everyday dishes like Welsh rabbit, cauliflower and cheese, and chili con carne as ways of conjuring familiar tastes that they missed. But later on as a prisoner of war, I mean, we were absolutely starving. I was 12 stone. That was my normal weight, about 12 stone. When I was released as a prisoner, I was five and a half stone. Because of their meager diets, many suffered vitamin deficiency diseases, such as beriberi, night blindness, and dermatitis. 
the other source of, um, of vitamins was to get, um, go down the Tiger Beer Brewery uh, and to bring the yeast back and uh, feed the yeast to, to the guys as well. Uh, another great source of, of, of vitamins was the lalang grass. It was all around the camp. And they could pull that in, they make it into a stew, crush it down, making it a very ugly, very foul tasting concoction, but it had vitamins in enough to, to stave off vitamin deficiency. How best to survive, as much as the people, the prisoners of war in Changi, they were also highly inventive. They did lots of things, you see. Even shoes out of various things and radio, battery, all kinds of things. Well, as you say, necessity made people to become inventive. And this included resourceful ways to get a nutritious fix. Lucia Bach was in charge of making wreaths for the dead. And so I was very cunning. I used to say to them, now look, will you bring us this particular flower, this, this little pink flower? But they say, why do you want begonia? I said, because, you see, it's a very special flower. If you make wreaths and you put plenty of begonia in it, the dead won't come back and haunt you. There'll be no ghosts. And of course, the Japanese were very afraid of ghosts. And I said to them, now, you're going out to get flowers. Get a lot of this begonia. Bring me as much as you can of begonia. Yes, we will. We'll get it. We'll get it. We'll get it somewhere. Even if we've got to go to the botanical colonies, we'll get you your, uh, your begonia. And do you know why I wanted the begonia? Do we need to... I was feeding on the begonia <laughs> and the full of vitamins. You'd find that they would have cooking clubs in the back of the houses. So a bunch of guys would get together and they would throw in all their rations and everything. They would eat together in a small group. One of the greatest things you could do for your mate, your buddy, was to give him your ration and to share something to you. And giving a present of food became very, very important because you didn't have a lot to give. So, so food became um, almost um, a different currency, a different, a different importance to, to your life. The cohesion of disparate prisoners was something very touching, but by and large, there was an unspoken comradeship kept alive the humanity within me and made me perhaps recognize more clearly that great qualities, qualities that I appreciated in human beings were not necessarily confined to the wealthy or to the educated. That the rough, semi-educated laborer, odd jobs man, had human qualities which were good and which felt good and which were of value to his fellow prisoners. The life of a POW in Sionan was hard. It was even worse if you were unlucky enough to be sent to the death railway. But there were small comforts, such as friendship or a hot meal that made life bearable. Food was always on their mind, but what they were really dreaming about was to be free. <laughs> 